Hello and welcome to History for Weirdos. We're your hosts, Andrew and Stephanie. And each week, we're going to take you on a journey into the strange, obscure, and relentlessly entertaining corners of human history. Now listen up, friends, because it's about to get weird. Hello, weirdos, and welcome to episode number 35 of the History for Weirdos podcast. What's going on, weirdos? We're so happy to be back. We took a a little break last week, um, you may have noticed, and we appreciate everyone's support when we take little breaks. Those little mental health breaks are sometimes needed. Yes. Uh, But we are back, and Andrew has a great episode for us, already ready to go. Mm -hmm. Uh... (laughs) Mm-hmm. You have to edit that out. I'm not editing that out. Okay. Well, we also wanted to say happy Black History Month. In the United States, February is Black History Month. And so we are celebrating with you all today because obviously Black history plays a huge part in American history. It does. It does. And it's often overshadowed and not talked about, which is just honestly a shame because it's, you know, we're like, it's literally censoring a part of of how you know we got to where we are today exactly i think that's such a great point and it's also i think it's really in line with our podcast to talk about for different reasons right some are sillier some are more more for more serious reasons but to talk about his stories in history that for whatever reason got shadowed or overshadowed or lost exactly yeah and it is interesting you bring up black history month tell me because (gasps) the man the myth, the legend. Well, I guess he's not really a myth. Um, <laughs> he's a real person. He was a real person. And he, I'm talking about one of the most prolific actors of the 20th century with a career spanning over 50 years. Over 50 years. Yes. And just a true weirdo in the best sense of the word. Okay. Not only was he an actor, but he's also a director okay. and a diplomat. What? Which I actually didn't know. Yeah, this is pretty cool. He was even knighted by Queen Elizabeth <gasps> II of England in 1974. A knight. And yeah, he was a knight and awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the wow. highest civilian honor in the United States, by President Barack Obama in 2009. Oh. So, like, Tell two the- really cool awards? Yeah. Like, designations, I guess? Honors? Honors, yes. Achievements? This is The Amazing Life of Sidney Poitier. Yay! Yes. This is going to be a good one. Yeah. Um, is he still alive? N- no, he just died. Okay, that's what I thought. So he, Sidney Poitier uh, just died last month. So we're recording this in February of t- 2022. He died about a month ago in early January of yes. 2022. Yes, that is what I recall. Yes. Oh, well, how lovely to, we're going to get to honor him in this episode. Yeah, and I felt honestly very um, honored that I get to do this. Yeah, you this know? is a good idea. Yeah, I, I really think it's it's kind of perfect timing. You know, yeah. sadly for him, I mean, but you know, he lived to be almost like a hundred. So what I was going to say he, it, must he have lived been so a, old. Yeah, he had a really long life. So I mean, you know, it was, and it sounds like he had a really cool life. It was really cool. I'm yeah. jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's really crazy because his life was incredible, mm-hmm. like it nuts. Um, his origin story, you know, so to speak, like it's really reminiscent. It's kind of strange. It's reminiscent of like ancient semi-legendary like founders of civilizations. Okay. Like, like I'm talking about like Sargon of Akkad, um, Cyrus the Great of Persia, Romulus of Rome, you know, like what? It, it's really weird. There's some certain corollaries where you're like, what? That's kind of strange. Like basically like started off like, you know, Humble beginnings to right. then, you know, becoming epic. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of with him. And, like, a really, like, sh- like crappy circumstance is the beginning of your life. Mm-hmm. Where you, but you're, like, truly, like, I mean, you know, he wasn't necessarily, like, a noble like a lot of those other folks were, mm-hmm. you know, according to legend, right? A lot of these ancient people had, like, basically the same origin story, just tweaks here and there. Right. Over the course of thousands of years. But, um, yeah, it, it's just kind of weird because this was, like, a 20th century version of it. It was kind of strange. Oh, well, tell us more. Yeah. So, you know what? Let's just dive in. Okay. He was born on February 20th, 1927 in Miami, unexpectedly because he was three months premature. Oh, wow. So, okay. Also, I have to point out. Yes. 
My odd boy was born in 1928. Oh my god, that's crazy. So she's really old. She's really old. And his birthday, the February 20th, mm-hmm. is the same um, birthday as my grandfather. My late grandfather. Oh my god, and it's the day after your birthday. And it's the day after my birthday. It's kind of crazy. Oh wow. Yeah, kind of cool. So he was three months early. He was born three months early, guys. Like, that's crazy. That's a rough start. That's rough. Um, I mean, he wasn't even expected to live. Uh, His parents nursed him to health over the course of, you know, the next three months, right? Before moving back to the Bahamas. But since he was born in the United States, he was granted American citizenship, which... It was really dope for him. Yeah. Not every country has that, right? The Right, the, the rule of the land. The rule of the land. So if yeah. you're born here, you're a citizen forever. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and until he was about 10 years old, he lived on a place called Cat Island <gasps> in the Bahamas. I don't know. So there is a Cat Island, I think, in Japan. By what? the way, that is literally just a ton of cats. <gasps> yeah. I know. I want to go too. My allergies would go You're, wild. You would die. I would die, but it's worth it. It's kind of worth it, yeah. But he was born on a cat island where maybe it wasn't over, yeah. like run by I, cats. I don't think so. I don't think so. But how cool. Uh-huh. Imagine an island <laughs> Yes. that's governed and ruled by, by ki- cats, by so kitties. How would they, will they communicate in like, uh, like human languages? Like with meows. Oh, uh, like just we, meows. We would have to develop to understand their meows. Oh, Okay. And I mean, it's what pretty... type of cats are they? Big cats, or little cats, like domestic cats? Are they like tigers, oh, lions? Snap. No, I was like thinking... panthers. Okay, you made it really intense. <laughs> I was thinking pumas, <laughs> just domestic bobcats, <laughs> <sighs> servals. Never mind. Go back to Cat Island. <laughs> tell me what's happening. As you guys can tell, I really like animals. Yes, I really do. Um, so he lived on Cat Island until he was about 10 years old. And then he, he and his family moved to Nassau, um, where he experienced like electricity, cars, and just the general modern world for like the first time ever. Wow. I mean, yeah. Think of the time and how underdeveloped yeah. the Bahamas were at that time. Right. It would have been 1937 that he moved to Nassau. Wow. Um, or Nassau. I, I really don't know how to properly pronounce that. Nassau? I think it's, they say Nassau. Nassau. Okay. Yeah. So he eventually, he briefly moved to Miami um, at the age of 15, but like experienced a shit ton of racism. Wow. Yeah, sorry, excuse my French, but it was bad. And like literally couldn't stand it and within months moved to New York City and tried to pursue becoming an actor. Mm-hmm. You know, spoiler alert, everyone, he's <laughs> successful. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yes. He's kind of a big deal. Yeah. And so also I have to warn everyone, like there are certain um, uh, organizations that have words in them that are kind of dated. Dated. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm and the, it's coming up right now. Mm-hmm. He auditioned for a part with a theater group called the American Negro Theater. Uh-huh. Um, again, I apologize, in, you know, now in retrospect, but that's just the name of what it was called. Right. And, um, Guess what? He didn't get the part. He didn't get... Yeah. Oh, that's always cool to hear, though. I know. When, like, iconic people, you know... Fail. Start, fail out. <laughs> yeah. Like, especially when they're starting and they're learning because it reminds us that when we're starting a new dream or a new endeavor... Right. We're going to fail. Guys, this is, Sid, like, one of the most prolific actors of the 20th century and, yeah. and like, American history, and he literally didn't get a part in, like, a small theater group. Yeah. So... You know, don't ever feel bad if you fail, especially at the beginning. Um, but he was determined. Why didn't he get the part? Do you know? Yes, um, because he had trouble reading. <gasps> really? Yeah, so he could speak English, but he had trouble reading it. And what? so, get this. So he had a job as a dishwasher just because that was his, like, day job, right? Mm-hmm. And there was this nice elderly Jewish waiter who essentially taught him how to read better. Shut up. I know. This just sounds those... like a movie in and of itself. Right? It is. Like... I, if, if they don't make a biopic on <gasps> Sidney Poitier, I'd be so upset. Oh my god! He need like Denzel Washington. I think Denzel is the only Washington person, would like, have to play the older version of him. I yeah. don't know who would play a young version and, of him. Oh, actually, I, I, I Denzel is actually in the story, but very much later. Oh, okay, so cool. we'll revisit him. But yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, so he failed and tried to read read. better but you know around this time also you know this is the early to mid 40s so world war ii right Mm -hmm. and he decided to enlist in the army and he was only 16 by the way (gasps) so he lied about his age what yeah so he lied i i think this was pretty common back then like people would lie and like you know 15 16 year olds would lie 17 year olds 
and they would enlist early. Wow. And like the army didn't really like you weren't supposed to, and if they found out, you could get in trouble. But in general, they kind of just like they weren't investigating. Yeah, it, it wasn't in their interest to. Mm-hmm. When my grandfather, um, my American grandfather, enlisted in the navy, he was seventeen, I think. Mm-hmm. And that's also the year he got married. And for oh whatever God. reason, I, he didn't need his parents' permission to enlist at that time. That's I don't know weird. if it was like a New York thing. I don't know. Yeah. But he always remembers that he didn't need to, to get their permission to enlist in the military, but he needed their written permission to get married to my grandmother. That's so weird. Isn't that so weird? We just have some very interesting priorities here in this country. <laughs> um, like, yeah, like you can take out like a $200,000 loan to go to college when you're 18 years old. When you're a baby. But you can't have a beer. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Anyways, I, we could go on for days about that. So we're just going to move on. Yeah. Okay. So he's 16. He lies about his age so that yes. he can enlist during World War II. Absolutely. And so what he does is he was assigned to, get this, the Veterans Administration Hospital. Yay! In Northport, New York. And was trained to work with psychi- psychiatric patients. Excuse oh my me. gosh, you guys. We have this in common. I used to work for the VA hospital and I worked with psychiatric patients. So you're basically Sydney Poitier. I mean, I'm destined for greatness. Clearly. <laughs> Clearly. Clearly. <laughs> so, and yeah, ironically, get this, what? Poitier became upset with how the hospital treated its patients, even feigning mental illness to obtain his discharge. I literally did the same thing. Well, maybe not that last bit, but... You know. <laughs> I <laughs> but, had mental breakdowns and left. <laughs> yeah, because the wow yeah well i don't want to get like get into it but they also didn't care about their patients exactly so some things really don't change mm-hmm. potier confessed actually to a psychiatrist that he was faking his condition but the doctor was just sympathetic and granted his discharge in december of 1944 i will also say the conditions of a psychiatric facility a federal psychiatric facility at that time treating young men coming home from the most gruesome war up to date the conditions would have been horrendous like yeah they weren't and the treatments weren't effective right right so i can only imagine how arduous that was for him how painful that was for him absolutely and also wasn't it around this time where they stopped calling it shell shock and actually started calling it post-traumatic stress disorder or is it later i don't later? know if it was around this time that term became much more popularized uh with the return of vietnam veterans mm, okay i don't know when it was initially used though that's a good question okay but definitely like this is where we started studying it more i don't think it had really been even though they were aware of quote-unquote shell shock before this is after this war and the brutalization that those young men went through this is when we started studying it right because like after world war one they're just like i'll just shake it off you know you yeah of course you saw your like your friends get literally like brutalized and you know dismembered and stuff but But whatever just get over it man go home to your wife and kids and be normal yeah (laughs) god (laughs) oh boy all right. And it was shortly after here, though, that he re-auditioned for the American Negro Theater. And this time, drumroll please. That was horrible. Oh, my God. He was rejected. <laughs> oh, my God. Really? No. Oh. He, he, he was successful. <laughs> oh, yay. He yeah, got so the part. He got the part. And um, he got the part, but his early career was pretty rocky. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, first of all, he was tone deaf. Oh, really? Yeah, so he, he wasn't the greatest singer in the world. Um, so he wasn't in musicals? No, and you know now it's like, well, you know, it's not the biggest deal in the world. But back then, oh, this is so bad, but that, that was, it was expected of black actors to be able to be great singers and dancers, right? Wow. Yeah, this is how long ago um, that is this was. So, it's it's hor- like <laughs> It's so stereotypical. It's like that's absurd. That's crazy to like box all black actors into yeah. like, oh, you you must be good at singing oh, and dancing. Your skin pigmentation is X, so therefore you must be good at dancing. That's crazy. And yeah. so this was not good for his resume, basically. Yeah, he's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor guy. Yeah, I know. It, it wasn't great. Um, he also... What you know was something else that he did that didn't help was that he was a founding member of the committee for the Negro in the Arts. Again, I apologize, but that is the name of the organization. Um, in this organization, uh, were committed to a you know quote unquote left wing analysis of class and racial exploitation. Oh damn, Sydney! I know, yeah. So 
But again, this was, you know, late 40s, early 50s, mm-hmm. communism was mm-hmm. starting to rise, right? Yeah. Obviously. And people were afraid of yeah, it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. People, uh, he was blacklisted a lot of the time. Um, For his political views. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. But this did not deter our boy Sidney, who nevertheless persevered. Mm. So Obviously. Obviously. Yeah. In 1949, he was at a crossroads. So at this point in his career, he had basically had to choose between theater and film. Mm-hmm. Unsurprisingly to us, spoiler alert, he chose film. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, thank God, right? So his very first movie was a 1950 film called, yeah, 1950. Wow. Yeah, this guy literally died last month. 1950. (laughs) He was old. It was called No Way Out, where he played a doctor who treated, you know, a white man who was just insanely racist. Very overt in his yeah. racism. And kind of funny story, the actor who played the insanely racist dude, they uh, they ended up becoming like really good friends. Oh, wow. He was like an old-timey actor. I don't even know his name. And um, this is Sidney Poitier's first role. His very first role and in the film. And he's dealing with such a heavy topic yes. as an actor. Yes. That's hard. It's very hard. Um, it was really good. In fact, like the movie ends and... I just put this in there because it's kind of awesome. The movie ends with Poitier saying to the guy who he's saving his life once again, like at the very end. Like, and I'm assuming the guy doesn't want to be treated by yeah, him. Yeah, because he's black, mm-hmm. you know? And he says, don't cry, white boy. You're going to live. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was so funny. That's the last line that he says? Yeah. And this guy literally tried to kill him in the movie, by the way. Oh, my God. Yeah. And Poitier is just like, I will save your life because I'm a doctor and I'm like that good of a person. Right. Um, really cool. So his performance was deemed to be incredible, and this was, you know, considered his breakout role, his very yeah. first film. Um, you know, this, of course, led to more roles in movies like Cry the Beloved Country in 51, Blackboard Jungle in 1955, and Edge of the City in 1957. So what's crazy about this, too, is that each of his performance, you know, in each subsequent film just got better and more prolific. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's that's rare. It's rare. Yeah. He just got better and better. And everyone, you know, not everyone, but a lot of people started to pick up on this. And apparently his role in Edge of the City was so good that he became kind of like a household name in the U.S. And this was 57. This was 1957. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, at this point, you can kind of consider him to be, like, the, f- the first black, like, movie star in American film history. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like, obviously, he wasn't the first black actor to be on tele- or you know, on film. Yeah. But he's, like, the first one that's, like, kind of, like, a star. And in leading roles. And, exactly. like, keeps getting these good leading roles. Becomes yes. a household name. And I'm actually going to go into kind of, like, a brief analysis of the roles because it's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Not, not this second. Oh, I... It's coming up. Okay. But, you know, in general, though, his roles were more prominent than most. And to be frank, they were just honestly way more interesting than any other roles given to black actors before. Right. He probably had actual, like, fully fleshed out characters and lines. Yeah. Generally and complexity. speaking, mm-hmm. yeah, he had some complexity and he wasn't just like a caricature. Yes. Mm-hmm. So in 1958, he was nominated for Best Actor um, in the Academy Awards for his performance in the film The Defiant Ones, where he, stayed, where he starred alongside Tony Curtis. Mm-hmm. And this was the first time a black actor had been nominated for that award. What? Yeah, for Best Actor. Oh my god. 1958, yeah. That's crazy. So he didn't win, but he got nominated. Oh. Yeah. And his rise to stardom, well, I think, was solidified, but he wasn't even close to being done. Wow, that alone would be like quite a career. Right. Yeah, yeah. if he could just stop now, it'd been like, oh wow, that's amazing. Not even close. The following year he starred in a Broadway stage production, so going back to Broadway, <gasps> a Raisin in the Sun, uh, where he would be nominated and would win a Tony Award. He won a Tony? Yeah, for best actor in a in a play. Even though he was tone deaf? Yeah, so I guess he got better. I don't know, I th- it might have been a, it might have been a, a straight show. Okay. So like no singing. Okay. Or he's, or just got a, he's voice a famous actor, actor and yeah. he got someone to teach him. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Or, a, yeah, not a, a voice singing trainer? Co- voice trainer, singing, singing coach. coach. Yeah. We said that at the same time. That was cool. <laughs> All right, so not only that, but it became like a very culturally relevant play as it introduced many black themes to a very predominantly white Broadway audience. Oh, my God. So he's just a freaking trailblazer. He's just a trail. Everything he's doing is just like... Like, oh my God, that's amazing. Oh my God, that's amazing. Mm. Uh, Again, kind of (laughs) jealous. So, but you know what? He didn't have a podcast, so. 
I have Sidney Poitier beat there. He did not have a history podcast, so uh, take that, bro. Did you add in history just in case he did have a podcast? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. I was like, maybe he did have a podcast. I don't know. <laughs> but I know for a fact he did not have a history podcast, so... <laughs> There, bro. I got you there. <laughs> so um, later, the director of the play, Lloyd Richards, would say that it was the first play to which large number of black folks were drawn to, to the a audience? Broadway film or oh. a Broadway show. Excuse me. Very yeah. cool. And even later, in, all the way in 1983, so this was, I think, 59 mm-hmm. in 83, the New York Times wrote that A Raisin in the Sun changed American theater forever. That's incredible. I wonder if they still do performances of that that would be cool to see I, I had never heard of it but then again i'm not like a big like me play neither aficionado, so no every once in a while though like i'll i'll watch one that i, I really yeah. like but same i'm not the person that right. goes like, to the theater they didn't often. have wicked or <laughs> or uh that was like the first one that came to mind the wicked. second one is a book of Mor- a book of mormon or the book of mormon i loved greece as a kid oh greece yeah mm-hmm. i saw that lo- actually i saw that in broadway Oh, really? Yeah, when I was like 13. All right. Well, I saw The Lion King on Broadway. I saw it here in LA, but I did not see it in Broadway. Yeah, I didn't either. I saw it here in LA. So it's not a Broadway show. Isn't it still a Broadway? But it's not on Broadway. It's not on Broadway, but But like... But it's like the same crew. Don't Broadway shows go on tours? I don't know. Oh my God. We sound like such dorks. Yes. Someone listening is like shouting at us the correct procedurals for Broadway performances. You guys, yeah. And I apologize. Just comment somewhere. Tell us where we're wrong. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So not to be outdone by himself. (laughs) He starred in a film that same year. So 1959 and was nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Actor. What a show off. I know, man. he's such a show off. So he really started to make his mark in the 50s, but it's in the 60s that he essentially become like the true undeniable badass that makes his incredible mark in like Hollywood history. Okay. Um, in 63, he started a movie called Lilies of the Field, where he plays mm-hmm. like a wandering handyman who decides to build a chapel for a bunch of refugee nuns. What? Because who would do that? Is I guess? this like a cool indie film? I wouldn't thing? know if it's a cool indie film because, like... Or is it a comedy? Uh, Well, it was a smash, and he won <laughs> the Oscar for Best Actor the following year, so, for this movie. that's That sounds like a really weird kind of boring plot, though. Yeah. I'm a handyman, and there's a refugee nuns. Like, where are they from? <laughs> yeah, I know. Isn't it so weird? Does I know. I just stumble like... upon them in a field? Where does he find... <laughs> I, I a... saw that, like, synopsis, and I was like... What the? Who was high when they wrote this? What? I really, I'm curious though. I'm gonna look it up later. Yeah, you should. So, Lilies of the Field is what Lilies it's called. Lilies of the Field. Mm-hmm. And you know, he was the first black actor to win Best Actor. Oh yeah! Oh my God! So he's the first one to be nominated and to win. Yeah, in two separate issues over time. So yeah. Right? So he is just a force in Hollywood now. Like, I mean, commercially and um, critically. Right. He just and he's a babe. Yes, he was incredibly good looking. I was like, God, I hate you. Uh, no, I, I don't. I really don't. He's actually really cool. It's like impossible to hate him. Yeah. Um, and he's just iconic. Like that's I don't know how else to describe him at this point. And he's, he's still- not even done. Like, and he's iconic. I mean, even today, right? Like, think of how old he was when he passed. Still a household name. Oh yeah, everyone's like, oh yeah, Sidney Poitier. Like, yeah. I know who he is, and he. I, I was born what seventy years after he was. Yeah, that's. When you put it like that, that is Not insane. Not quite 70, but oh, close. That's insane. It's like insane. Like more than a lifetime. Yeah. Like, yeah. seriously. And I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention that many of his movies had themes about racism and the unjust persecution of black folks, you know, here in the United States, but also the world at large. That's amazing that, I don't know, that they were even, like, that he had success with those topics. Yeah, and he was, and, you know white audiences loved him yeah. right because i mean people today get pushback for those subjects and right film. i can't imagine but back 1950 then. like yeah. he, uh, you know like not even the 50 like 1950 that's crazy you know like he was he, so old yeah i know he's so old um <laughs> and you know also you know i like i mentioned earlier he was cast in roles that were not typically given to black actors yeah um, again, like I sort of had mentioned, black actors were typically given roles v- with that were very stereotypical, um, uh, with incredibly absurd racial undertones. Yeah. Right. Uh, like negative, of course. Yeah. Um, I can't even really describe it. Just know that it wasn't good. 
Um, but Poitier was not given these types of roles. Mm -hmm. uh, in, instead, was usually cast as some version of the more traditional hero archetype, yeah. usually reserved for white actors at the time. So he was like the leading man. He was the leading man. Yeah. So the first time he was like ever that there was like a leading man in Hollywood who was black. That's so Him. cool. Um, and again, like another first for Poitier, like this guy is just on a tear. Also, on the topic of racism, mm -hmm. Poitier was in the 1963 March in Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Oh, hell yeah, he yeah. was. And That's so cool. The one, yeah, and for you that don't know, this is where MLK delivered his iconic I Have a Dream speech. How freaking cool yeah. to have been there. And there's, get this, there's even a really, really cool picture of him with Charlton Heston <laughs> and Harry Belafonte in front of the Lincoln Memorial. We'll have to post this. that. Oh yeah, we'll post this. That um, is so cool. It also, was so what cool. A, what a gang. Dude, to such be a gang. Out. I know, man. I would, dude, what I wouldn't give, like... To have been there hanging out with them. Oh my god, it would have been so dope. would be like, hey guys, uh... Apart from so. obviously listening to MLK's I Have a Dream speech. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that very, like, like, historically monumentous occasion. Right. Oh yeah, there, there's that too. <laughs> but to hang out with these three guys, amazing. Yeah. I don't, I don't know, babe. Like, okay, MLK or Sidney Poitier, I, I, I really don't know who would want to hang out with more. I, I honestly, this sounds really bad, but I, I lean towards Sidney Poitier. Because you think he'd be, like, more of a good time? Probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah, MLK might be a little bit downer. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, he's just, like, you know. More reserved. Yeah, more reserved. And you'd want to party with your historical right. figures. Exactly. And Sidney Poitier would be like, oh, man, let's go. Let's go party. Let's go party. No, I, yeah. I mean, MLK is also, like, one of the most, like, amazing Americans to ever live. But... Yeah, what was the church that we went to, the famous in England? In oh, yeah, like, I mean, the... Uh, the Abbey of something. Something Abbey? Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, oh, no. what the hell? What it's, like, church the called? church in London. In London, where they have all the famous dead people buried there. Yeah. Like, uh... Henry VIII's, like, wife and mom and all Elizabeth the... II? Yeah. Or no, first, first. Yeah, Elizabeth II is not, not dead yet. That would be the... ironic if she, like, dies tomorrow or something when this airs. That would be crazy. All the poets... Uh, well, anyway, you know, you oh guys know. Uh, uh, that church... Uh, this is so embarrassing. We have a history podcast. That church... <laughs> there's, um in, like, Catholic slash, like, Anglican churches, right? There's often reliefs. So, like, sculptures within the walls of saints mm -hmm. or of jesus or angels whatever but in on the facade of this church that name is escaping us at the moment and it's just one of the most famous churches in the entire world but yeah it has whatever. um icons of like peace and change and love and um mlk is the only american on there was oh yeah yeah he's the only american on the church yeah there's a statue of abraham lincoln like right next to it uh, like across the street yeah, yeah we saw that but yeah, but on the church itself, isn't that only... like on the church, like like a uh, like a saint would be, which yeah. I thought was so cool. Oh my god, we're gonna feel so bad that we can't remember the name of it. Oh, it's so embarrassing. You should just look it up on your phone right now. Okay, and then, you and keep going. I'll yeah, I'll keep on going. You for distract the listeners. I'll I'll Google. Okay, so later on in the sixties, he played even more iconic roles. Well, maybe not even more, but still incredibly iconic roles. So first, there was a film called In the Heat of the Night, where he plays a detective who investigates a murder in the deep south in Mississippi. In the Heat of the Night is a very sexy title. I know. Um, Westminster def Abbey. Westminster Abbey. Wow. We are... <sighs> we... Okay. That was embarrassing. Everyone move on. Stop talking about it. Okay. okay cool. Yeah. We already <laughs> forgot about it. Okay. New York Times critic Bosley Crowther called... <laughs> I know. What a name. Bosley Crowther. Bosley Crowther here. Called In the Heat of the Night the most powerful film... I have seen in a long time. No big deal. That's cool. I want to watch it. I do too. Then he played a man in an interracial relationship with a white woman, Catherine Houghton, uh -huh. in the film Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Yes. So this was probably... It's a very the, famous one. Yes. And mm -hmm. it's, it's famous because it's probably the first time that this type of relationship was portrayed on screen as, a, as positive. As it was still illegal in a lot of states only six months before it was released. Yeah. It was obviously because of the um, the Loving case, right? Yeah. That very mm -hmm. famous Supreme Court case. It was federally legal, but I did know that uh, some states did not technically legalize interracial relationships until like freaking like 2011, 2012. 
Oh, wow. Like, it, they were symbolic, right? you know, changes to the law, but a lot like, of states, just because it was federally legal, it was still very taboo. Yeah. And at this point, it absolutely was. Yeah. So, by this point, he had received a lot of praise, right? But he did receive a bit of criticism in that his roles were very repetitive, right? Okay. Kind of... No one's perfect. I know. And it's like, whatever. <laughs> to be honest, though, like, the criticism was that, like... Oh, you, you're, you're like, characters don't have any faults, right? Oh, he always played, like, the perfect the, leading man. Yeah, it was like, you're perfect. You don't have any flaws whatsoever. And I, I kind of get it, like, but at the time, you know, and That's I, how I all agree. all leading characters were, though. Right. And, like, also, I agree with his assessment at the time was that, you know, he was fine with it because he wanted to show that black people in cinema could essentially be more than, you know, caricatures on screen and can actually be, like, the main good guy in yeah, the film. Yeah, hell yeah. yeah he was so repairing a lot of damage. If that was done, like, damage. today, I'd kind of agree with that assessment. But back then, no, I don't agree. Yeah, I think that's well put. So what's crazy, too, is, like, he just continues to act. Like, in, th- in like, films, all the way, his last film was in 1997. Oh, my God. Yeah, during our lifetime. Yeah. So, it's crazy. He's, he, he starred in movies with people that were born in the 1800s. And also, he starred in movies with, like, people like Richard Gere, Bruce Willis, and Dan <gasps> Aykroyd. Oh my god. <laughs> I know. Like just that juxtaposition like blows my mind. Like Die Hard guy Bruce Willis. Dar- so he started in a movie with Die Hard man and he also started movies with people who were born in the 19th century. People like, who were in the silent films. Yes. Probably in the talkies. Yeah, in the talkies. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the coolest things he did though was um he became an ambassador to Japan from the Bahamas, you know, representing the country of the Bahamas concurrently with him also being the ambassador to unesco for the bahamas what a freaking overachiever (laughs) i know i'm like dude like can you please just chill save some glory for the rest of us i know i'm like that's so cool oh and also he was on the board of directors for disney because of course he was (gasps) that's so cool yeah and like the mid 90s to the early 2000s that's Ah. way cooler i thought the ambassador one was cooler (laughs) I mean, his, like, just achievement was just too much. Like, there's too many to, to mention. I also, like, you know, didn't really go into it too much. But he also had, you know, kind of a directing career as well. And, okay. like, starting in the 70s and into the 80s. That's incredible. So, I mean, I was just like, whatever, bro. Like, You've like, done a lot. You've done a lot. I mean, he's more known for being an actor. But mm-hmm. I also wanted to just mention kind of the other things. Just because he was such an amazing person, right? He like, did so much. practically universally loved. Like, mm. you know, and maybe the people who don't like him are, like... Uh, super racist. So it's like, yeah. well, you know, mm-hmm. those are that's he, he doesn't care about their opinions. Yeah, I don't think he really cares. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, his, again, his achievements just too many to mention. Um, Denzel Washington, remember? Yeah, he, yeah you, you yes. mentioned him at the beginning. He so at the, the same time he won, he was the second black man to win the the best picture or I'm sorry, sorry, best actor. Best actor. Denzel Washington was yeah, in like 2001 for Training Day. That was the second time yeah is not that crazy oh my god i know it's nuts um so Oof. he said you know like when he accepted his award he said to like about sydney poitier because i you know ironically enough maybe not ironically enough um he had been given that same academy awards like the lifetime achievement award kind of oh that thing. same year yeah that same year oh, and that's so awesome. Denzel Washington, like, you know, basically said in his acceptance speech, like, I'll always be chasing you, Sydney. I'll always be following in your footsteps. And there's nothing I'd rather do, sir. Oh, how I know. respectful. So respectful. Oh, that's so sweet. There's Denzel nothing Washington I'd rather do. So and good. also, like, Denzel Washington is a huge, iconic name, too. So to have one icon acknowledge another. I know. That's so cool. Damn. And it's so dope. After such a legendary career in life, though, he died at the age of 94 last month in January, like I had mentioned. Yeah. He was essentially just a man. Last month, so if he had lived to this month, he would have been 95 because his birthday's February 20th. Yes, yeah. I know. Ugh, damn it. So close. I know, like Betty White, just so close. Yeah, just shy of 100. Mm-hmm. Oh, I know, and he died like a week after Betty White. Oh, yeah, you're right, you're right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was kind of like people were still reeling from Betty White, and then Freaking he dies, and it's like, come on, man. They always, like, do that in groups. Celebrities yeah. do that thing. 
Dying. Just dying, like, all together. You're <laughs> yeah. like, strange. Mm-hmm. So a man as universally loved and respected as he was, he was given many tributes, mm-hmm. right, after he died. And pretty much everyone from Hollywood to business executives to former presidents of the United States. Jeez. Like, multiple. Um, and it's funny because there's not too many alive. Uh, Jimmy Carter's still alive, right? God, I think he is. <laughs> this must be ancient, speaking of like old people. How old so, is Jimmy Carter? Jeez. I don't know. Like I think 500 or something. <laughs> <laughs> like so 500. the man was just truly a force for good and inspiration. And he was a weirdo, I think, in the best sense possible. And that he broke down barriers. He broke down barriers. And again, it was like honestly like an honor to do this episode on him. And just mm. to give a brief synopsis of his life. And a, a weirdo in the sense that, like, no one would have expected him, like you said, to be in the roles that he was going after. Right. And he was like, I don't care. I'm still going to go after them. And then what a cool thing to do after acting. Like, I'm going to be, like, an ambassador of a bunch of stuff. I'm going to, like, hang out with, like, Mickey Mouse. I'm going to do all these other cool things right? with my life because I'm not done yet. Yeah, I just got, you said hang out with Mickey Mouse. I didn't hear what you said he did for Disney. I just He was him. on the board. Oh. Um, <laughs> I just pictured him kind of like out a with... big deal. I would just want to hang out with Mickey Mouse. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. That'd be really cool. Um, but yeah, so he, uh, you know, and again, like kind of going back to his birth and circumstances and everything, it really, and then like his life mm. and he became so successful, right? And became, you know, essentially like a power figure in Hollywood, right? Like from such humble beginnings, from such humble beginnings, it is incredibly reminiscent of ancient, you know, like those semi-legendary stories mm. of like, you know, the beginning of civilizations, right? A Sargon of Akkad, like 4,500 years ago to, you know, Romulus and Cyrus, like two, like 2,500 ish years ago. You're right. It is actually a really common, um, literary theme too. Yeah. Literary and like religion also, right? Mm-hmm. This idea of like the big hero coming from nothing and making something of himself so that is it's, i mean but it's his real life yeah so like, that makes it that much it's cooler. not semi-legendary it's 100 yeah. percent real mm-hmm. it's crazy and so of course uh to end it all lend uh list my sources here i start off with the new york times encyclopedia britannica notable biographies imdb achievement.org mm. biography.com and of course our favorite, Wikipedia. That's awesome, my love. This yeah. was a great episode. I know. I really liked it. I learned a lot. I didn't know, to be honest, I didn't know anything about him other than like he was a really iconic actor and he was super handsome. Well, that's about it. <laughs> Everyone has a crush on him. I know. Yeah, he was he was a good looking dude. Yeah. Um. Thank you so much, though, for sharing... So much of his life and yeah. his legacy. I learned so much, like, researching him. It was crazy. Like, and just kind of a really cool guy. Like, I don't know. It was, it reminded me of the, kind of that episode where I did Lawrence of Arabia mm-hmm. a little bit. They kind of... Just like these, like, legendary lives. Yeah, yeah. Like, just absolutely legendary lives. That's so cool. And for everyone listening, we'll be sure to post, like, a series of really cool and iconic photos of him on our Instagram. So if mm-hmm. you don't follow us there already... Yeah, follow us on Instagram. You can also reach us at our email, historyforweirdos at gmail.com. And on Instagram, we're at historyforweirdos. Yes. Um, feel free to comment all of the crazy errors that we like may have said. Yeah. Things about Broadway and Westminster Abbey that are inaccurate. Yeah. Just let us know. Our, and also, <laughs> heartfelt apology to our friends across the pond um, that we forgot Westminster Abbey. Like You're probably like thinking, wow, typical Americans. I swear, if we just had a brain fart. We did a two-hour tour. Yeah, we literally had a two-hour tour, tour, tour of Westminster Abbey, and we still forgot the name of it, which is just embarrassing. But do you know why we forgot the name? Why? Because we've been binge-watching Downton Abbey. Yeah, that's... And that's the only word that kept coming into my head when I would think Abbey. Downton Abbey. Yeah. So nice. that's why. It's not our fault. It's Downton Abbey's fault. That's, let's blame the TV show. Absolutely. <laughs> For our shortcomings. <laughs> yes, that sounds right. Okay, weirdos. Well, you know, it's always a pleasure, and I hope you enjoy this episode. And until next time. Until next time, weirdos, be sure to share, rate, review, and subscribe. Woohoo!